after a cell decides to become a neuron, it needs to go on a hunt. It needs to go hunt for its target. It needs to project its axon over some distance. It could be fairly local within the same uh, nucleus if this is going to be a local circuit neuron, maybe a local inhibitory interneuron or something like that. Alternatively, it may have to project over very long distances. Uh, this could be within nervous tissue, like that of an upper motor neuron, going from the cortex to the spinal cord, crossing midline once and only once, or it could be uh, some great distance that it has to traverse outside of the nervous system, like a lower motor neuron that doesn't cross the midline, but instead projects ipsilaterally over some variable distance until it finds the right muscle. Either way, that neuron is going to have a dynamic structure called the growth cone at the end of its axon that's going to project a little philopodia and go sniffing around. It'll play a little game of Marco Polo, asking if there's attractive cues or repulsive cues. In one case, it will grow in one direction and uh, retract in the other, causing directional movement. These guidance cues are going to be uh, long distance and local to give kind of broad and more specific instructions on where the axon should go. And they're also quite dynamic. The cues can change over time to allow movement during some period of development but not others. And the growing cells can adjust how they respond to these guidance cues based on what other signaling molecules they're exposed to or changes in gene expression. First we're going to talk about the uh, guidance cues that affect the growth cone. So we can have long distance or we can have more close range cues that require direct interaction with surface proteins. So there are guidepost cells that spit out diffusible proteins that are going to act as either attractants or repellents for axons. So in this little cartoon here you can see the red uh, repulsive cue and the green attractive cue. Uh, those are going to provide kind of general instructions. And then there are short range cues that aren't diffusible. Instead, these are going to be surface proteins that axons can either stick to or not. And that'll have kind of the final uh, say in specifically where the axon goes. There's a few of these uh, signaling molecules that we should probably remember and their effect is going to depend on the receptors that are present. Because we're going to have axons moving in different directions. Some need to move toward the midline, some away. Some need to move anteriorly, some need to move posteriorly. They're going to respond to the same gradient of guidance cues, but they can do so in different ways by having different receptors. So, the first class that we're going to talk about. This will be our guidance cue. Netrin. So nitrons are going to be fairly important for attracting uh, axons down to the midline and allowing them to cross once and only once. They're going to have both attractive and repulsive receptors. So two different receptors here, DCC is going to attract and on 5 is going to repel. So what we're looking at in these data would be the effects of netrin on axon growth. Now normally netrin is released in the ventral uh, floor plate of the developing uh, neural tube. So that's going to bring axons downward. When we knock out netrin, no more attractive cue there. There are going to be other cues that will go over. There will be some repulsive uh, BMPs that are pushing axons away from the top, but they're not being strongly pulled down toward the ventral spinal cord, so you see the axons kind of move down, but there's not this focused movement toward the midline. This is just showing you the different uh, actions of the receptors. So when we only have DCC receptors, what they're doing is spitting out a little bit of netrin there. And you'll notice in panel A, the axon is turning toward uh, the netrin. In panel B, when they have both DCC and now on 5 this 
repulsive receptor is going to translate netrin into chemo repulsion. So rather than turning toward that little puff of netrin, that's what the little arrow is showing you. So they have a pipette releasing netrin. Now the axon is going to turn away. So depending on which receptors you have, you're going to respond differently to netrin. Semaphorins, semaphorins are going to, uh, for the most part, be repulsive uh, to axons, but some axons can actually be attracted to semaphorins. So for the semaphorins, we're going to be binding to plexin receptors. And these are going to be repulsive unless we happen to have a whole lot of cyclic GMP around. This is going to activate intracellular kinases that then affect the outcome of semaphorin binding to plexin receptors. Now what we'll find out in the next lecture is that the production of cyclic GMP is fairly important for the development of dendrites. So it would make sense then that in an area where we have a lot of cyclic GMP production, that would be an area where we have dendrites, and it would make sense to attract axons to dendrites, and that's the lovely system that we have in place here. So if you look at panel A and B, that's showing you again a little pipette puffing out semaphorins. D and E is showing you the same thing, we're putting out the same semaphorin there, but what we've done is apply cyclic GMP you'll notice that the cell responds differently. So if you'll just look at C and F, that's a summary of multiple axons. Semaphorins are, for the most part, repellent. You'll notice they're always turning away, unless we have cyclic GMP around. Then semaphorin uh, binding to plexin is actually going to translate to chemoattraction. So it's somehow going to differently affect the actin cytoskeleton. <clears throat> Likely this has to do with activity on rho GTPases. The next guidance cue that we need to think about would be slits. So slits are going to bind to roundabout receptors or roboreceptors. These are going to be, for the most part, repellent. Robo 1 or 2 are going to be repellent. We can translate slits into chemoattraction though with robo-3. What robo-3 is going to do is inhibit the activity of the other roundabout receptors. The roundabout receptors themselves, as we'll see, can also affect these other chemoattractants, for example, binding to DCC receptors and inactivating them. That's going to prevent attraction and will help also translate to repulsion. So when it's slit and robo-1 or 2, we're going to think repulsion. And with Robo-3, we're going to think attraction. So the data over here are showing us uh, just that. So what they're looking at is uh, the outgrowth of some transplanted cortical neurons. So they put a little, little bit of cortical neuron down. Uh, you can look at panel I for the uh, schematic here. And below that, they had some hex cells that they transfected either with nothing uh, or with slit 1. So they're going to make slit and they're going to spit it out. There's an end truncated version that doesn't seem to do anything in this case. Um, it depends on which, which type of experimental setup you use this in. Sometimes it promotes dendritic growth, sometimes it does nothing in this case. So don't worry about that slit in. That's a, a, a laboratory drive uh, form of slit. So this just tells us that the end terminus is probably important for the function of slit binding to the roboreceptors. So compare F and G. All those lines are different axons. So in F, when we're, when we're looking at axons kind of going in all directions, that tells us we have no real gradient here. Then they apply a gradient by putting those hex cells right here that make a whole bunch of slit. That's going to bind to robo-1,2 in this case and prevent growth in this direction. And that's why in panel G you're going to see a whole lot more axons growing upward. So that's because we're repelling those axons because of the slit proteins. <clears throat>
Then we have our efferents and our F receptors. So these are going to do slightly uh, different things. So if it's if it's F A, uh, that is going to be uh, repulsive with the efferent A receptors. Even I can't read that. I'm standing right next to it. The attractive ones would be B and Efren B. <clears throat> so we'll revisit these later whenever we talk about uh, topographic mapping right at the end, but there's going to be different Fs and different Efren uh, ligands. So the Efrens will bind to F receptors, and depending on whether it's A or B, that's going to give you repulsion or attraction. And by having a couple different gradients of attractive and repulsive cues, we can uh, reliably maintain spatial relationships between neurons. And that's all topographic mapping is. So your position in the retina is going to be uh, similar to your position in the optic tectum or the superior colliculus. Then we have uh, the, the morphogens. So there's, there's many of these. The one that we're going to talk about is, is Wnt. This is fairly important for development, so we encountered this last lecture. It's back. Wnt's going to have a couple different receptors here. So there's frizzled, and then there's derailed. Uh, frizzled is a G protein coupled receptor, derailed is a receptor tyrosine kinase, so sometimes you'll see it called this, RYK. That's just receptor tyrosine kinase, or YK. So depending on which uh, receptor you have, you're going to respond to WNT differently. So that WNT gradient that we created last lecture, where it's high in anterior regions, lower in posterior regions, is going to allow axons that have uh, derailed receptors for example, to be repelled by that and move posteriorly, while axons with frizzled receptors will move anteriorly. And what these morphogens are going to do is, of course, cause uh, a, a, a change in cytoskeleton dynamics. So if you have a frizzled receptor like this uh, neuron does, the application of went there in the right portion, you'll see, creates a much larger growth cone. So this axon is going to hunt out its uh, path a little more effectively. On the other hand, if you have derailed receptors, then the presence of WNT is going to prevent axon growth. So what they have here is a little agar block, and, and rather than having hex cells, these are going to be uh, cough cells that express either GFP on the left, so basically nothing, or uh, GFP and WNT 5A on the right. So if you look in panel B and D, that's whenever we have WNT. A and C, nothing there, so we shouldn't see anything with the agar block, other than a slight change in how light moves through it. In wild-type uh, cortical neurons, you'll notice not a whole lot of axon growth into that went. So these are likely cortical neurons that want to then move downward because they have derailed receptors. They're going to move to lower parts of that went gradient. When you knock out derailed receptors, compare panel B to D. No axons in B growing uh, under that agar block, but in D we can still see axons growing because we've removed that repulsive cue. Then we have growth factors. These are going to bind to different receptors, and what they're going to do is attract axons. So, your neurotrophins are a great example, and we'll talk about these again in this unit. These are fairly important. There's a variety of neurotrophins they'll bind to different receptors. So I'll just put their track receptors here. These are going to be attractive. Different growth factors are going to attract different axons based on whether or not their axon has that receptor for them. So what we're looking at here is an axon growing into an NGF coated bead. Nerve growth factor would be one of those neurotrophins. This axon has track A receptors, and what that does is allow it to sense that. NGF and grow toward it. 
This is especially important uh, for sensory neurons uh, and neurons in the peripheral nervous system. So these are fairly simple. They seem to only be attractive. Now the way the guidance cues work is by affecting the growth, the stability, and the movement of our actin cytoskeleton. So the growth cone, that, that dynamic tip of the axon, those are going to have actin around the outside, microtubules in the inside, and that actin is going to create very dynamic structures. So it creates this kind of fan-shaped structure, the lamellopodia, and coming off of that are little fingers, the philopodia. So it's going to create this kind of fan-like structure. So if you look over there at the, at the uh, microscope images, you'll see kind of the fan, kind of flat portion of the growth cone. There will be little extensions that are highly dynamic. That's your philopodia. So a growth cone is going to have kind of a fanned out structure and it will be extending and retracting little finger-like projections. So they'll grow. If they don't stick, we're going to pull them back in. If we do stick in this direction, we're going to move the growth cone forward. So maybe we didn't find anything here. We found something we like here. We're going to then grow that growth cone in this direction. And we'll have directional movement. Now we'll play a little bit of Marco Polo again. We'll stick out some Philopodia and see where we're we picking up stuff now. Maybe these are the lucky winners. And we're going to grow our growth cone in this direction. So we'll get turning. But it's all about actin structures. So. As in any cell, you're going to find actin near the periphery, and it's a whole lot more dynamic than any other cytoskeletal filament. <clears throat> Here we can actually see the actin and microtubules in their kind of uh, uh, typical locations in the growth cone. So if you look on the bottom of the image there, actin is in red. Tubulin, or the microtubules, are in green. They are near the center. This is a more stable portion of the growth cone. The actin at the periphery, you, can, you see that big old um, uh, lamellopodia there, so it's putting out the fan, trying to search for growth cones. I'm sorry, trying to search for uh, guidance cues. The actin filaments are less stable, they're a lot more dynamic, and they're going to go on the hunt. So let's have a look at a growth cone here. The way that uh, guidance cues are going to work is by affecting the extension and withdrawal of the leading edge. So here they're just applying a, a, a growth factor, so that's going to be attractive. Green is showing us actin, uh, red is showing us the microtubules in this case, so it's flipped from the last one. And what I want you to notice is that it's kind of turning in that direction. Most of the actin filaments that we're making are oriented toward that arrow where they've applied the growth factor. So we're back at the beginning here. Uh, actin filaments aren't as present here, so they're going to apply the growth factor that's going to stabilize actin, so we have a whole lot more filaments and the image gets greater. Now I want you to notice those filaments, they're being put out and they're pulled back in. This is that actin treadmilling that we see in every cell. Actin is very dynamic. We're always pulling on it and we're adding to the plus end. So they're never really stable. If they have a set length, it's because they're growing as fast as they're shrinking. The way that guidance cues are going to work is by either being very local surface proteins to which the growth cone can stick. That way it can pull itself in that direction. Or they're going to uh, affect the, the stability of actin filaments so that they can elongate further in one direction, but they tend to fall apart in another direction. So it's, it's all about actin as far as moving that growth cone around. Now actin filaments are treadmilling. So they're, they're, they're growing on one end and then they're being pulled back in. So we're always pulling on them with myosin motor proteins. So we're going to be, we're going to be running toward the plus end, but myosin's fixed. So we're actually pulling the, the actin filament back. 
will keep adding actin um, monomers onto the plus end. If that growth is at the same rate that myosin is pulling it, we see no net change. If we're adding actin faster than we're pulling it, we'll see growth. And if we're not acting, if we're not adding actin as quickly as myosin is pulling it, we'll see shrinkage. And this cartoon is just showing you that dynamic nature of actin. So that myosin down there is always pulling it. So there, there's a little surface protein attached to that actin and it's being pulled backwards. All the pink ones are just showing you new actin filaments. So there's not much of a change in the length of this actin filament, but it is still dynamic. It's still changing. Now, whenever we pull on that actin, whether or not the actin filament moves or the motor protein moves depends on whether that actin is stuck in place because connected to that actin would be surface proteins. These could be cell adhesion molecules like integrins and cadherins that bind to other cell adhesion molecules. Integrins will bind to extracellular matrix components. Cadherins will bind to other cadherins. But they also bind to the actin cytoskeleton. So now if we pull on that actin cytoskeleton and we're attached to something, we're going to get a different response than if we're not attached. So let's think about this. We got two growing filaments. The one on top didn't stick to anything. So it's got that surface uh, receptor. Let's say it's an integrin, but it couldn't stick to this extracellular matrix. Didn't have the right proteins for it. When myosin pulls on actin, it's going to retract that filament. That's what happened in these cases up here. We're going to pull on this actin filament, and if we didn't stick, we're going to pull it back into the growth cone. On the other hand, let's Let's revisit our lucky winners here. So these philopodia were able to stick. Here we found surface receptors that we could stick to. So now we're still going to pull on our actin. But rather than pulling the philopodia back, we're going to pull the growth cone forward. And then we've now had a little bit of movement in this direction. We're still pulling on actin. We're essentially going fishing. We're going to cast out a line and we're going to pull it back in. Now if we happen to catch something, well rather than pulling the line back in, that's going to pull the growth cone forward. I like to think of it as a rock climber. You can think of it however it works for you. So if we grab onto a hold and we can get a good grip, we'll pull ourselves forward. If we don't have anything to hold onto, we're just flapping our arms around. Now, of course, if we're going to go find these surface proteins, we have to be able to build our actin filaments. And what guidance cues are going to do, if they're attractive, they're going to stabilize the cytoskeleton. They're going to cause growth in their direction, and that's going to allow those filaments to extend a little further, and we're going to see more growth in that direction because the cytoskeleton is most stable going toward that guidance cue. On the other hand, if we have a repulsive cue up here, some, we'll put some minus signs, so we don't want to grow in this direction. If we extend an actin filament this way, that repulsive cue is going to somehow destabilize the cytoskeleton. We might find out in the next slide. So rather than building filaments, these actin filaments fall apart into monomers. They can't grow quite as far. So our cytoskeleton stability is going to be much greater in this direction than it is over here. Thus, we can only grow in this direction. <clears throat> so it's going to depend on um, which cues do we have present. And then those attractive cues that stabilize the cytoskeleton pull us that way, repulsive cues push us away. What translates from receptor binding to actin dynamics would be the Rho GTPases. There's a few kind of master regulators. There's RAC, Rho A, and CDC42. These are all G proteins in the Rho GTPAs family. When you hear Rho GTPAs, just think um, actin stability.
growth of actin filaments. That's generally what rho GDPases are going to do. Of course, the devil's in the details. And just like other G proteins, when they're bound to GTP, they're active. They are GTPases, so they will hydrolyze that GTP to form GDP and turn themselves off. So the reason that netrin is going to be an attractive cue through DCC receptors is because DCC receptors are going to stimulate RAC. RAC is then going to promote uh, the growth of actin filaments by inhibiting enzymes that break down actin and stimulating uh, uh, enzymes that help build actin. On the other hand, the semaphorin receptors, the plexins, those uh, are going to have GTPase activating functions. So they can bind directly to RAC and turn it off. So even if it's bound with GTP, when semaphorin binds to the plexin receptor, that stimulates RAC to hydrolyze the GTP and turn itself off. So we know there's direct interaction because of the crystal structure shown over here. So if you are into that kind of thing, you could look at panel D. Uh, if you're really into uh, binding affinity assays, look at panel C. Uh, that'll, that'll get you going. Uh, if you just want to see the effects, look at the bottom right, panels G and H. So in panel G, they've just got some little cells growing, and actin is shown in green here. You'll see it's a little bit brighter around the periphery. In H, they applied semaphorin, and you can see the collapse of actin filaments afterward. The same thing occurs in growth cones. So semaphorins are going to generally repel axons because they lead to collapse of actin filaments. Now, if we're going to actually have long-term directional growth, we got to move our microtubules into the growth cone. So they're going to be all along the axon. It's going to help us for long distance transport. We stabilize our movement once we put in microtubules. Actin is going to be made, pulled back, destroyed, but the tubulin is going to be stable and more long lived. So here you're just uh, looking at time lapsed imaging of the growth cone and um, more specifically tubulin. And what you'll notice is that after that growth cone appears, kind of on the bottom right there, so the first thing that comes in is going to be actin. The growth cone kind of spreads out a bit. So if you look in panel B, for example, it, at the first part there, uh, it looks like it's 5 minutes, 32 seconds. The growth cone's kind of fanned out a bit, and then it sort of focuses, and you get a more, uh, you get a clearer path because we start laying down that, that track of tubulin. So once we start building tubulin there, then we're kind of refining the direction that the axon is going to take. Branch points uh, aren't going to be uh, as likely here. And now we'll spread out a new growth cone and go on the hunt. Now, these attractive and repulsive cues aren't static, so they can change. And the receptors that, that cells have can change over time. And that is, of course, going to affect the growth of axons. For example, how do we cross the midline once and only once? We have to be able to cross it at some point, otherwise we wouldn't cross it. And we have to be prevented from crossing it again, otherwise axons would. So there has to be dynamic regulation to create a narrow window of time where axons can move through some area and then prevent it from happening again. So we cross once. This is what allows the left side of our brain to control the right side of the body, crossing the midline just once. So in the developing uh, neural tube, we're of course going to have gradients of uh, attractive and repulsive cues that are going to be created in different parts. So we have the, the uh, dorsal roof plate, and then we have the ventral floor plate. And this is true in brain, spinal cord. So we got our, our little uh, developing neural tube here.
and the dorsal roof plate and the ventral floor plate. We've got cells that are going to spit out guidance cues. So we got repulsive bone morphogenic proteins and we have attractive cues down here such as the hedgehog proteins growth factors and of course nitrogen. That's going to allow neurons in this dorsal portion to grow away from the dorsal roof plate because BMPs push it away and down toward the midline. So they're going to leave repulsive areas, grow toward attractive areas. And then they need to be drawn to the midline and brought over. We're going to see the ability to do that depends very much on netrins. And we know this is the case because whenever we have mutations in DCC receptors, we see issues with midline crossing. So you get these mirror movements here. So this gentleman is just trying to move only his left index finger. He does a pretty darn good job of that, but you'll notice on the right, there's a little bit of movement. So just move the left, but there's a little bit going on on the right. When he moves his right, some movement in the left. So there's not a clean control of one side of the body. There is a little bit of mixing. That's because the guidance cue of Netrin, DCC, is disrupted. So, netrin receptors, or the DCC receptors, are likely to be important for crossing the midline. Let's see if that's the case. So, um, down here in the midline, here we're going to have slit. High levels of slit expression. Remember, we got a couple different types of receptors. We got Robo3 that's going to cancel out Robo1 and 2, and these repel axons. Now, these early axons that are growing down, they first have expression of Robo3 to cancel out the inhibitory effects of slit. That's going to allow them to enter midline. So we have Robo3 when we enter. Write R3 here. When we enter midline, we're going to change the expression of our Robo receptors. So they're going to uh, lose, uh, they're going to decrease expression of commissureless. This is a protein that's going to affect the trafficking of Robo receptors. So now we're not holding the Robo1 and 2 in reserve. So we're going to increase Robo1 whenever we get to midline. So let's go ahead and enter. And we're going to downregulate Robo3. So now we're in an area we can't possibly stay in. We used to not mind the slit when we had Robo3 and not a whole lot of Robo1, but now that we have high levels of Robo1 expression, we got to get out. We can't go back in. Now, of course, we're drawn down here very strongly by Netrin. We just don't mind the slit. Slit isn't attracting us. Once we get down there into the ventral floor plate, <clears throat> now we mind slit we leave, and not only that, we no longer care about netrin. So if we're going to grow away from the midline, if we're going to actually leave, we have to get rid of this attractive cue of netrin. So what Robo1 does is inhibit DCC receptors. So even though we had a whole bunch of netrin here, now we don't hear it and we are repelled by the slits that are present there. What that does is allow us to cross once 
and only once, because now it's impossible to re-enter midline. We've crossed and we can never cross back in this case. Our only option now is to grow anteriorly or posteriorly, and that's going to depend on where you're at. So if you're down there in, let's say, the spinal thalamic tract, so you're down in the spinal cord, you want to project anteriorly. Well, you need to be attracted to that went gradient. So here, dorsal ventral, if we flip this around and look at our neural tube, and we'll have some swellings down here, for the brain, so this would be the anterior portion, posterior portion, we've got a went gradient where there's a lot of went toward the front. If you're going to go toward the front, you need to have a receptor that's attracted by went. So we need that G protein coupled receptor. So in the spinal thalamic tract, we're going to grow anteriorly because we have frizzle. While the corticospinal tract, for example, is going to grow from the brain on down to the spinal cord, well, that's going to have our uh, derailed receptor tyrosine kinase. So we're going to ride the same gradient of wind, but we're going to go in two different directions because we have different receptors. So we'll cross, and then we'll run down if we're already at the top and have derailed. Or we'll cross and then head on up if we're already at the bottom and have frizzled. So if we take into account at least two chemical gradients, we can, for the most part, uh, carry out some pretty decent topographic mapping. Sometimes we need a little more than two. But what we're trying to do is reserve spatial relationships. My finger is next to my hand, is next to my arm. This map in my body needs to be maintained so that I can make a little map in my head. So that it's not chaos in our motor and sensory areas or visual areas, there's mapping that makes sense with the rest of the world. Your retina gets mapped fairly well onto your visual cortex and other visual areas. The example we're going to go through here is the uh, superior colliculus or the, the optic tectum. Same thing. We, we preserve spatial relationships so that neurons that are next to each other in, in let's say, the uh, the somatosensory cortex, deal with parts of the body that are next to each other. Or neurons that are next to each other in the visual cortex respond to areas of our visual field that are next to each other because they get input from retinal ganglion cells that are next to each other. So we can preserve these spatial relationships as long as our axons go to pretty similar places. I'm going to end up somewhere next to my neighbors. And then the place that we project to, they're going to end up somewhere next to their neighbors. The way that they do that is with having dorsoventral and anterior-posterior uh, gradients of guidance cues, attractive and repulsive cues that are going to push and pull axons into different areas. So we're going to go through the topographic mapping from the retina to the optic tectum. We're going to be looking at uh, efferent and went gradients here. Alright, so efferent A, that's repellent. So efferent is going to bind to uh, F receptors, so remember A, repellent. So FA binding to efferent A, repellent. Alright, let's map these out. So we're going to be going from different parts of the retina on different parts of the tectum. So nasal, toward the nose, temporal, kind of toward the temple, and then dorsal, ventral. Okay, so we'll just kind of recreate this image that they have there. Here's our retina, here's the tectum. So, nasal, temporal, dorsal, ventral. Over there in the tectum, anterior, posterior, dorsal ventral. Now, remember that um, we have a lens and that's going to flip images as they go through it, so we're going to be flipping here. 
we're going to have to flip our image uh, back so that it makes sense. So we're going to be kind of crossing over here. So the efferent A and the FA uh, gradients are going to generate that anterior posterior axis. So we have the receptor down here. So I'm kind of limited on colors. High to low. Can roll the nasal for F. A. I'm gonna put that up top. I need room. Up here, we have a similar gradient of the efferent A ligand. Repulsive. So the temporal retinal ganglion cells, these are going to start to be repelled earliest. So they aren't going to grow as far. They can only settle in the most anterior regions of this optic tectum here. So they can't go that far. Those in the nasal regions that have very low levels of FA, they're not going to be repelled early on so that they can innervate further regions of our optic tectum. I'll put a little star there for the targets. So we kind of flip there. Those in the middle can only go to kind of mid-range. Now the dorsal ventral axis is going to be created by different efferents, in this case efferent B and FB. Go with a little brown here, B for brown. So again, F's down here. And for FB, efferent B interactions, this is going to be attractive just like it was early on. In this case we're not matching, we're going to flip over and it's attractive. <clears throat> so those that have kind of lower levels won't quite be as attracted to efferent as those with highest levels. Of course, these are going to want to cross over and settle into the regions that have the highest level of the attractive Q, which they're going to pick up there. These aren't going to care too much. In order to solve this mystery of where our dorsal neurons are going to go, we got to look to one more gradient, and that would be the winds. This will be Ephraim B or Wint same kind of gradient, high in the dorsal. What's different here is going to be the expression of different receptors. So if, if we're talking about the attractive receptor here, so frizzled will be equal concentrations across. Repulsive Derail is going to be highest in the ventral portions of the retina. All right, so we got another gradient that we need to think about. Okay, so the the wind activates frizzled receptors. Those are going to be our attractive cues. We can track those then at the the low concentrations there. Derailed receptors, those are going to be our, again, our repulsive cue. We're going to be activating those at higher concentrations. We've got essentially equal levels of frizzled. What differs here is the derailed. So, where we have high levels of derailed expression, these are going to be repelled by even uh, low levels of, of wind. So there's no real preference. 
what they're going to be guided by would be that efferent gradient. But here, in the dorsal region, these have fairly low levels of derailed, so it's going to only be the higher levels of went that are repulsive. So only when we have high concentrations can we stimulate the low levels of this repulsion. So they're going to be attracted to went as long as it's in low enough concentrations that we don't activate derailed. So we want to avoid these higher went concentrations in the dorsal portion. So what we're going to end up doing is projecting ventrally to keep went levels low so that we don't have a high enough concentration to stimulate these derailed. This is going to flip our image, you'll notice, to correct that move that happened in the lens. And so now we've got neurons that are next to each other in one area, next to each other in their target. So ventral next to nasal, that becomes dorsal next to posterior. Temporal next to dorsal, that's going to become anterior next to ventral. Pretty nifty stuff. And you're going to find this with motor areas and uh, somatosensory areas. For the auditory cortex, the mapping is going to be based off of uh, the tone that they respond to. Um, that's a little harder to think about, I suppose. Smell and taste is chaos. Uh, but for vision and, and somatosensation, things that have good spatial relationships, those are going to be preserved because the axons uh, are going to listen to different guidance cues and neurons near one another in one location have a little more similar uh, types of gene expression than neurons that are further away, so they're going to tend to go to similar areas. Now the next thing we have to do is build some dendrites and then make a synapse. Next thing you know we got ourselves a, a finished nervous system. If anything was confusing on this, please use the questions box so I know what to chat about in class. I'll see you later.